Well, she, we uh, should continue now with our discussion of uh, the international revolt against the Cold War, 1964 to 1968. Uh, so last time we were taking up a series of topics that are indicated on the outline that I uh, that I distributed to you. We talked about um, uh, Kennedy versus Khrushchev, uh, the great uh, uh, struggle in nuclear diplomacy uh, uh, played out on a global scale. Talked about the import, at least we got somewhat into the uh, uh, implications of the Kennedy assassination, how it changed uh, things. We get a little bit better picture of that today. I'll have to expand on that topic today. Um, and then we talked about the uh, Soviet succession and uh, the, um, uh, the uh, campaign of, um, of Mikhail Suslov to get rid of Nikita Khrushchev, um, largely for his, for his foreign policy, largely for the things that were done uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, that Soviet Union didn't want to live on the nuclear brink. They had rejected the dullest style of nuclear brinkmanship as pursued by Nikita Khrushchev. They didn't want to live that way. They wanted things to be much more calm, much more straightforward, and uh, they rejected adventurism, as they put it, adventurism, subjectivism, and harebrained schemes. Uh, they wanted to return to a Leninist tradition of collective collective leadership, which they felt they were losing with Khrushchev. Khrushchev was emerging, in effect, as perhaps too powerful as an individual. Um, uh, and uh, they're thinking about, of course, the example of Stalin. Khrushchev as a kind of threat to be a Stalin, a threat, a threat to rise above the collective leadership, um, and a threat toward, toward a new kind of regime of the rule of the personality. And uh, Soviets have certain, how to put it, um, um, uh, certain reflexes. Um, Against, against this idea. So that's indicated by the uh, removal of Khrushchev by a full Central Committee vote in uh, 1964. Uh, you might call it the Central Committee democracy. That's, that'd be a way of looking at it. Uh, Soviet Union, um, uh, in short, um, and opting for detente, uh, you might say, in a very real way by removing uh, Khrushchev from power. Um, were they somehow affected or inspired by the assassination of, of uh, John Kennedy? Um, uh, just a few months prior to this? Well, that's hard to figure. Uh, not an easy question to, an to answer. In fact, uh, often one doesn't even see the thing posed because it is so difficult, <laughs> difficult, to, uh, pro difficult to process. But maybe they were somehow affected by this, affected by the idea of uh, removing their uh, leader. I don't know. It's hard, hard to say. It's a question I can raise but can't give a very adequate uh, answer to my own uh, to my own question. So from this point on, Soviet Union is going to be pretty, how to, how to put it, uh, detentist minded. They're, they're, they're going to want stability in world affairs. They're going to want stability in their own affairs, especially in their leadership uh, affairs. Um, and they're going to be a little quieter in foreign policy. De Gaulle uh, made the argument that the uh, Cold War was won by the Cuban Missile Crisis and that the Soviets had essentially retired from world politics and were uh, behaving uh, throughout the rest of the 60s, um, uh, like a second-rate power. That was the way de Gaulle put it. And not a bad way of putting it, uh, strictly speaking. I think that is uh, a, a, an accurate, uh, good characterization of uh, Soviet behavior. Going to leave it to others and not going to uh, initiate things in, um, in world policy. So de Gaulle uh, uh, drew the conclusion from that, about which we'll speak in a few minutes. De Gaulle, de Gaulle drew the conclusion from that that uh, be possible to take some initiatives and maybe lead the Soviet Union, maybe have an influence on the Soviet Union. Remember I was talking about JFK, uh, thinking he could have an influence. And I think this is certainly thinkable, very, very thinkable. Um, the United States having a big influence over the Soviet Union with a, with a reasonably friendly policy. Uh, friendly maybe isn't the right word, but detente-minded policy. That is to say, a policy which stresses lessening of tensions, especially tensions in the nuclear sphere. So there's a kind of a continuation of this idea of um, maybe influencing the Soviet Union that we find in de Gaulle's foreign policy, about which we'll speak, um, we'll speak shortly. OK, so uh, we've come then to the Great Divide, 1965, between the, uh, as Todd Gitlin likes to put it in his uh, uh, marvelous book on the 60s, um, the, uh, uh, the good early 60s, the civil rights movement, nonviolence, Martin Luther King, all the rest of that, um, um, the um, 
subtle, subtle policy toward opposing the communists in Vietnam that Jack Kennedy pursued, that is to say, not with a lot of troops, um, in those things, the early 60s, and then the, uh, the bad later 60s, with 1965 as the, as the, uh, as the breaking off point. So 1965 becomes a rather important marker uh, for us in this, in this story. And then the story is quite a bit different after 1965. After 1965, what used to be civil rights, led by Martin Luther King, uh, turns into a black struggle of enormous proportions, led by people like Stokely Carmichael, H. Rapp Brown, Huey Newton, Bobby Seale of the Black Panther Party, and people of that sort. Um, you might call them black nationalists, uh, revolutionaries, advocates of black power. That was their slogan for the most part, black power after 1965. Uh, rather than civil rights, black power. Um, um, and um, and uh, then I said their effect on the rest of, um, of, uh, of politics. And um, you might ask the question about uh, whether all these changes that take place after 1965, that the, the black movement becoming more radical, and then, of course, um, sympathizers with civil rights. And this is many, many, many people uh, who are not African-Americans uh, symp sympathizing with, um, um, with the black struggle for, um, uh, for civil rights, the decision that they have to make, whether they're going to go to the left um, with the, uh, uh, the, black, the black youth. Now, I, I think of this, uh, for the most part, um, in terms of generation and class. And so I'll, I'll get to talking about that in, in just a minute. Uh, but before we do get started on that, let me ask one question about the beginning of this period. And once again, it's a question that doesn't really have an answer to it. And that's the question whether this whole big change that took place in the kind of liberal, leftist, and rather moderate movements of the early 60s, whether they turned, it, turned into the very radical, and in my opinion, quite revolutionary movements of the late 60s, whether this wasn't on account of the assassination of uh, Jack Kennedy or at any rate, the big changes that resulted after the assassination of Jack Kennedy and the assumption of power um, of Lyndon Johnson. And whether it all doesn't stem from the first act, as we indicated last time, the first act of the Johnson presidency, uh, which is to start bombing North Vietnam, as to say, to escalate uh, the war in, in Vietnam, where many would have thought, many would have thought that uh, John Kennedy would probably have been going in the opposite direction, taking people out of Vietnam, lessening our commitment, coming to terms, maybe even flirting with a neutralist solution, such as being, was being suggested by de Gaulle and the French. Um, but no, no, we're going on the path of escalation. We're gonna have a, a, a bigger, meaner, uh, more, how to put it, um, less restrained, less, uh, less um, scrupulous war against communism uh, was going to feature a lot of bombing from this point. So that's the way it's going to go for 10 years in Vietnam from this point on the bombing. But all, it all begins in 1965 with Lyndon Johnson. And then the question we have to ask is, is this the thing that made this the second half of the 60s so radical? That is to say, prior to this point, uh, did, did they have this kind of impulse that was created by all this bombing. Well, you're looking at a uh, propaganda uh, cartoon, uh, a Chinese propaganda cartoon. And that's pretty much the way they think of the U US bombing to, of, uh, of North Vietnam. It's pretty, pretty stern stuff, not very subtle, uh, right to the point. Um, you know, it, one could argue that um, uh, by the end of the 60s that many, many people in the world uh, began to think of the U.S. action in Vietnam in terms that are indicated in this cartoon. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, it means that many people in the world started, in effect, on account of the U.S. action in Vietnam, started, in effect, started to see the way the, uh, the see the, the conflict the way the Chinese did. So that was a kind of a shift in sympathies, I think, that uh, started to result from the advent of this bombing in uh, 1965. It had been advocated by W.W. W. Rostow, who'd done a uh, economic treatise a few years earlier that uh, was very 
influential with Jack Kennedy, would advocated modernization all over the world, uh, programs in aid to moder uh, modernization, um, import substitution industrialization, it was called in Latin America, um, and uh, tied up with the idea of the Alliance for Progress and that sort of thing. Um, uh, Jack, Jack Kennedy uh, took the view of Rostow uh, then uh, that um, maybe this is the, bait, the way to avoid communism. And this was Rostow's grand economic um, perspective on the matter, as indicated in his famous book, Stages of Economic Growth. Rostow said, um, uh, the period before industrialization is the time when the communists can take power. That's when societies are more, most vulnerable to communism. I don't know if that's a good historical generalization. Maybe it works for the Russian Revolution, although the Russian Revolution was industrializing already in the 1890s. So I don't know, we can't look so closely at Rostow's, um, Rostow's prescriptions as a, um, as a generalization from history. Uh, I don't know, it wouldn't wash with historians uh, to the same degree that it did with uh, people in Washington. Uh, but all right, once you accept this premise that communism comes during the preconditions period, the uh, idea is you're supposed to try and industrialize the whole world. And if the whole world is industrialized, they won't go communist. So it was an anti-communist strategy. The book was called an anti-communist manifesto when Rostow uh, first published it. Kennedy, well, that was pretty much his line. He's going to help everybody in the world. Alliance for Progress in Latin America, aid programs everywhere. Um, a very wholesome view of uh, the American um, um, uh, presence in, uh, in world affairs. You know, America is a kind of a subsidizer, supporter of modernization and everything that goes with that. Uh, well, Rostow also said we should start bombing North Vietnam. So he argued that when Kennedy was in power and uh, it didn't, didn't get anywhere with Kennedy. Uh, but as soon as Kennedy was gone, Johnson became quite um, dependent on Kennedy's uh, foreign policy advisors, well, on all of his advisors, but mostly on foreign policy, where uh, Johnson, like Harry Truman in 1945, uh, not very well-versed, not very sophisticated in his views about foreign policy, and therefore dependent on the views of certain, certain advisors. Well, these were the Kennedy advisors, Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense, McGeorge Bundy, National Security Advisor, uh, people of that sort were uh, uh, had Johnson's ear, and uh, Johnson pretty much uh, very dependent on their views. And uh, where Kennedy had a great power to resist W. W. Rostow, who Kennedy laughingly said uh, writes a paper every week. Uh, he said, "I can't read uh, um, um, Professor Rostow's papers as fast as he writes them." Um, so um, <laughs> he had a way of, uh, in a jocular way, had a way of resisting. Uh, most of the schemes of W.W. W. Rostow, not all of them, of course, but uh, some of the schemes of Rostow, and he certainly resisted them about bombing. Not the case with Johnson. So Johnson immediately looked to Rostow and started this campaign. So maybe that's the whole explanation, the whole difference in the two historical periods uh, for 1965 as a turning point uh, between these essentially two uh, periods, two uh, periods with two different kind of complexions. Um, um, in terms of uh, the U.S. the U.S. role in world politics. Um, okay, so maybe it all starts there, and maybe there's something to this cartoon. Um, um, after all, um, opposition then to the Vietnam War. I started to follow. Now, this is not an automatic process. I think generalizing. I lived through through a period. I was on a college campus. Uh, these things were hotly debated. I followed the debates on all the campuses, traveled around all the campuses. In those days, you did those sorts of things. If you're engaged in student movement, and I was, I was in SDS. And of course, I didn't agree with everybody in SDS. No, nobody agreed with everybody in SDS. Um, Students for a Democratic Society, this is the largest student organization. But we traveled around all the campuses. We met everybody else, got, got an idea what was being kicked around and debated and all the rest of that. I could say with um, a certain amount of confidence that in 1965, you could hardly find anybody who was against the Vietnam War. That's to say they followed Johnson into this bombing, uh, but with enormous trepidations. 
uh, we thought we were on the way out with John Kennedy. Uh, what does the bombing mean? Are we going to get a solution? Could Johnson be right? After all, arguing in terms of Cold War liberalism, and I think Cold War liberalism still is the main consensus in the United States, and, and we're, we're part of that, we students of the period. Um, maybe Johnson is a, a Cold War liberal who's a little bit tougher on foreign policy with the communists. Of course, we didn't mind toughness with the communists. Um, maybe Johnson will succeed uh, by being more, more ruthless, maybe. That's not really a good way to describe our attitude. We're just saying more realistic. And, and we had lots and lots of doubts. I think you could probably say this was something that uh, uh, was felt in American public opinion on a broad scale. Um, well, I don't know. Um, we're anti-communists, um, but do we want to engage in mass bombing on this scale? Uh, bombing them as if they were Nazi Germany. I mean, we did do horrible things to Nazi Germany during World War II with bombing. We've done horrible things in Asia, as we all know, uh, from bombing. Is bombing the is the panacea? Is that the trick? Is that the only way foreign policy can work? Is that the best way for the Cold War to go forward? Got to stop communism by, I don't know, attacking it from the air? Uh, with all of the killing of civilians, of innocents, uh, that is implied uh, by bombing. You know, bombs are quite indiscriminate. Uh, especially you're bombing cities when they were bombing Hanoi. So, I don't know, it's kind of a big step for people. I don't think they immediately turned against the war. I think most people, you know, it takes a long time for public opinion to change. You know, the analogy could be made with, a, you know, an ocean liner at sea. They say it takes nine miles for, for it to make a right angle tur, tur, turn. Maybe it takes a long time for public opinion to change on something um, and to... Uh, and to turn in a different direction. Well, the turn that we're talking about is a turn against the Vietnam War on the part of the American people, a part of Western people generally, especially among their youth. So it's a political story, but it's also a story of, um, of generations, uh, younger generations. So it's the black civil rights struggle, the struggle of generations. Um, let's talk more about this as we get into this. Now, let me give you a little uh, memoiristic uh, sort of uh, anecdote about this on my campus. Um, um, the opponents of the Vietnam War uh, decided to uh, start out uh, at the beginning. They decided they'd just start talking about it. <laughs> so Black Panthers did this too in Oakland. They would go someplace and stand on a chair in the, you know, and start shouting to people on a street corner. Well, you know, in the 30s, they did it from a soapbox, you know, it's that kind of thing. Um, but on a campus, I, you know, on a campus is a little more, slightly more feasible. But anyhow, uh, some opponents of the Vietnam War decided they'd start an anti-war movement. So um, they got up in front of the student union on a table and started hooting against the Vietnam War. It's a really bad idea. Remember all blah, blah, the experience of the French, blah, blah, blah. What is the U.S. trying to do? Uh, how about bombing? Blah, blah, blah. So they started making all these arguments uh, from the student union. No one listened to them. Zero. I did. I observed from about 40 feet away, watching this whole spectacle, fascinated, of course, naturally. Budding historian is fascinated with these things. Um, watching it all unfold, nobody even paused walking by the table and thought it was quite outlandish uh, for people to be shouting uh, in the middle of the day about some poli poli political matter. Um, and then I started, got in the habit of watching them every day because they did it every day at lunch. And of course, Laura, everybody has to go through, past this point to go into the student union uh, to have lunch. And so they all automatically had people they could shout at. I mean, you can't call them an audience, but there were people that they could shout at. Um, so they, um, 
they shouted and nothing, nothing happened. It, you know, several days. I, my recollection is more than a week, two weeks almost, day after day, nothing happened. And then finally, one or two people would stop and say, you're all wrong. We have to fight communism. What are you talking about? You're giving aid and comfort to the enemy. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, going on about uh, defense of, free world against communism, you know, arguing Cold War perspectives. Um, and, um, and they got in kind of a shouting match. That's the kind of went nowhere, people just shouting at each other, right? And a few days later, a couple of more people were gathered shouting. And they, oh, so they allowed the shouters, the uh, defenders of the Cold War, defenders of the Vietnam War, they allowed them to get on the table and um, have their say. And they would shout at that person. So this, you know, this is going on among six or eight people. <laughs> the thing is, it was going on for weeks. They had about six or eight people participating. In the rest. Everybody else well, wants to get their tuna fish sandwich and get started with eating lunch and, you know, well, doesn't have time for any of this nonsense. Um, but then, before you know it, a number of people like me <laughs> who always want to hear a debate when they hear some people having a debate, always want to hear what's being said naturally. I think it's a normal, I don't think there's anything perverse about that, uh, would stop and uh, listen uh, to what, what was being said. And so before you, had a new, before you knew it, they, they had a little group. You could never call it a crowd, uh, but it was a little group, you know, they were, they we're still talking about eight or 10, 15 people by this time standing around listening to these uh, debates and discussions going on among these people, and they keep talking now. They're always talking. Uh, the man who was leading it uh, currently uh, teaches at the uh, University of Houston and has become a, a brilliant, brilliant um, scholar. He's written brilliant, brilliant books about Mexico. Uh, he was a grad student, um, a terrific guy, and he was the one that led, led that, that whole thing. It was all his idea. You know? It was one person. <laughs> One person got this idea, and, um, and after a little while, some fraternity guys came sauntering by, and uh, I don't know why this is an iron law, but these fraternity guys took the view that, well, it's a lot of foolishness, arguing over a lot of all this stuff. Fraternity types used to like to talk about rabble-rousing. Nothing worse than rabble rousing. That's what this was. So they thought they'd have some fun, make some smart remarks. And their remarks were not very smart. And after a while, they started to look like absolute dunces uh, when people shouted things back at them. So they really helped the cause of the anti-war protesters. It really helped to have this fraternity guy opposition, as long as the fraternity guys would speak. That's what really helped <laughs> the opposition. Of course, the fraternity guys had done as Mussolini's fascists did in the 20s and come there with daggers and crowbars and that sort of thing and beat up everybody. Uh, it would have had a much greater effect, of course. It would have wiped this thing out altogether. But once there was a discussion and a debate, <laughs> they were going to lose. They were going to lose. In fact, they were going to practically build the movement. Um, once the fraternity guys got humiliated and kind of intellectually and spiritually routed, there started to be a number of people gathering around this thing. And before you knew it, large numbers, hundreds of people gathered around the table. And they had to set up a system of speakers um, um, for and against, for and against. Um, but they certainly developed a real discussion about the wisdom of the foreign policy of the United States vis-a-vis -vis the Vietnam War. And that's the way the anti-war movement got started. It's interesting in terms of the substance of the debate. Once, once again, looking at this little microcosm, this little footnote I'm looking at here, <laughs> I'm injecting all sorts of meaning into it. Uh, I'd be willing to wager that that scene went on on many, many college campuses all over the country or something the equivalent of it. Why not? Perhaps in the same stages. Uh, 
nobody interested at first, everybody thinking uh, the opposition view, the, the dissent, if you will, view uh, is ridiculous, it's rabble rousing, it's nonsense, it's foolish. Um, at first, uh, but then um, when the thing starts to go and uh, when discussion develops, um, it just gets out of hand. Once ordinary people who don't think uh, are drawn into the process of thinking, it's a contagion. It's the first steps that are, uh, that are prohibitive. Uh, but once you get past those first steps, once the debate starts, it's got a real momentum of its own. At any rate, um, this is my little anecdotal way, memoiristic way of indicating that among thinking people, and of course this is on college campuses first, but not exclusively, but among thinking people, uh, there developed this discussion about the wisdom of the Vietnam War. Now, what happens once you start to think about the Vietnam War? If you don't think about it, you're saying, well, the communists are causing us trouble. Vietnam's just in one case. We have to prove our credibility to beat up on them in Vietnam, and that'll teach a lesson to everybody else in the world. So Vietnam, we don't care. We're not even interested in the local circumstances of the thing. It's just the communists acting up in Vietnam. Uh, we have to beat them down there because, uh, uh, you know, we'd have to do that anywhere. Uh, uh, Vietnam is just, just a particular, but once you start getting into it, how about Vietnam? What is the Vietnam War? The first thing uh, that you start to contemplate is that it's originally a French war. Already was a very drawn out war between 1946 and 1954. Uh, with these same people against the French, Vietnamese nationalists led by communists for a long, long time against the, since 1931, um, against the French. So it's got a colonial setting. You get into all of that once you start discussing it, maybe reading a book on it, you know. And there were several, several writers who wanted to write, tell us about it. Uh, Bernard Fall was a powerful one. Actually, I should have a, uh, I should have a uh, picture of Bernard Fall's uh, books, one of the covers of Bernard Fall's books, F-A-L-L. He was uh, a historian of the um, modern Indo-Chinese struggle for national independence, you could say, and wrote a lot about the French in Indochina. Uh, but once you start discussing that, then you suddenly start to put it in a different context. It's not just a struggle against communism, it becomes a struggle to succeed where the French have failed. That is to say, the United States now it starts to take a seemingly, to all outward purposes, um, or I should say to all obvious purposes, um, as a um, successor to the French as an imperial force in Vietnam. Now, you don't have to say the US is a colonizer. I don't think that's the case. I don't think it was the case. It was not a colonizer. They wanted to set up a government that was hostile to communists. That's a, that's a bigger phrase than it seems, a government that's hostile to communists. Like what kind of government does that have to be? Even maybe some kind of a nasty right-wing military dictatorship that's uh, willing to murder people left and right. It might be a terrible, terrible right-wing regime. Maybe there are liberals who can do this and attractive people who can do this, but there are not very many. Here's the problem. In the abstract, there's the problem. All right, so there is the beginning then of an opposition. And then let's go a little bit further with the opposition. Once you take up the opposition, you've reversed your field on the Cold War. Remember, the Cold War is a substitution of a Cold War dynamic, of a dynamic of anti-communism. Um, a substitution for the dynamic of, or I should say the paradigm, of um, anti-colonial, let's say, uh, um, adjustment to colonialism. And you remember we made this generalization about um, the passage from 
the policy of Roosevelt, the policy of Truman. So let's continue with that thought that we've adopted a Cold War attitude that communism uh, is the big problem, not uh, the legacy of the imperial powers and the desire of third world pe peoples to get free of them. But communism is the big problem. Um, now it's being reversed. And maybe the paradigm is coming back and saying, maybe it's not so much communism, but it really is. The nationalism of a country in the third world that started out in a struggle against European imperialism and that the United States is putting itself in the position of being the heir to these imperialists, these European imperialists. I mean, whether you go from there to say that the U.S. becomes an imperialist thereby, that's another issue, but you've already made the turn. You've already made the turn when you say that's a question of struggle for independence on the part of the Vietnamese, led by the communists, to be sure. After this, people would kid themselves and say, oh, well, they're not really communists, they're really nationalists. Often this passes for wisdom, even among the wise. I've never seen a point to this argument. You can't discuss communism in uh, the Indo-Chinese context without talking about anti-imperialism, you know, communist movement grows up as an anti britain They're really indistinguishable. Uh, they're so tightly uh, knit, um, those two ideas. So, I don't know, it becomes almost ludicrous to say, oh, Ho Chi Minh's okay, let's not oppose him so much. Anti-communism is about, or the uh, struggle against Ho Chi Minh is, uh, is not a good idea because he's only a nationalist and not a communist. No, he was both. You have to confront this Cold War thing. You have to confront it. You have to say, I mean, does it make sense for U.S. foreign policy to be fighting communism um, in such a generalized, broadened, um, almost unsophisticated way? Uh, does it make sense? Anyhow, this is the debate, I think. I hope I'm describing it. I know many would describe it in different tones. I'm trying to give a kind of a general description of the sensibility of the debate, the main issue around which it turned and implication of that issue. Um, but that is the point, though, that uh, after the bombing, there developed an anti-war movement in the United States, beginning on the campuses, but spreading elsewhere. Why? Because there was a draft. Johnson was sending hundreds of thousands of drafted troops to Vietnam to fight in a war that they were not going to win. That's, that's a very important thing to note. It'd be one thing if they were going to win. I suppose Johnson could have got away with just about anything if he won. And that's what he kept thinking, naturally. Normal temptation of anybody in power. As long as I win, I can break all the rules. I can do God knows what. And if I don't win, perhaps it's because I wasn't unscrupulous enough. Oh, normal temptation. Normal temptation about anyone who uh, wields power in a great state. So that's what we're contending with, then, this big change that takes place in the... Uh, in the sentiment for the war and support for the war. And we're going to see this developing on an enormous scale, uh, beefed up every night by television coverage of the fighting at the front, which is quite inconclusive. They can hardly ever say, oh, we took this rail junction, uh, we took uh, some, such a strategic point. They can hardly ever make this claim. During World War II, most of the afternoon papers in the United States would have a little strip map on the border. You didn't even have to buy the paper. You could look at the strip map and you could see them fighting over some place in the world, you know, Guadalcanal or, uh, you know, some other place in the world, El Alamein. You could look at these strip maps and you could sort of get a strategic idea of what they were fighting over. You couldn't do that for Vietnam. They're not fighting over anything. <laughs> They're fighting to find the guerrilla enemy 
pin him down and kill him, destroy his forces somehow, when he doesn't want that to happen and has territory that's not easily accessible, not always with good roads, in fact, most of the time without, and places where they fight, the enemy tries to make sure there aren't good roads there. <laughs> so so they, they are determining the, uh, determining the terms of the battle, or calling it the terms of the battle, and the United States has to more or less meet them on those terms and develop our soldiers into ruthless guerrilla fighters able and willing to march through jungles, to kill with their automatic weapons or with their axes and entrenching tools at close hand, long period of time, presumably, because you can't tell whether you're winning or losing. You know, you can't tell uh, since it's not a matter of uh, strategic points on the map that you can point to that you're trying to seize, that might make all the difference. No, you're chasing these forces all over the place. Same thing the British were up against uh, when they fought the Americans. General Washington didn't give them battle. He ran up and down New York State, into New Jersey, <laughs> cross rivers, <laughs> anything to avoid battle. And the British very quickly, well, not so quickly, but eventually the, the British came to the conclusion that it was kind of pointless. You'd, they'd never be able to pinned down all the American forces and destroy them. And of course, there was another power intervening on the side of the United States, the French. Uh, but I think I can still make a little bit of an analogy. Maybe there was 4% of an analogy there. Uh, the refusal of troops to uh, the, uh, uh, the guerrilla forces to give, to give battle and the enemy's inability to pursue them. I think you can sort of make it a little bit of an analogy there about the Vietnam, the Vietnam situation. Well, at any rate, uh, there we were on that. Um, so how did the British see this matter? There's hardly anything written about this. But um, it is well worth noting, even if we can't pursue it properly, well worth noting that the very time the United States was fighting to, in effect, succeed the French as a sponsor to a, um, a client regime in uh, Vietnam, that the British were trying to create a Malayan state, a state around Malaya, including Singapore. They invented a name for it, Malaysia, Malaysia, supposed to include Singapore. Singapore broke with it after a while, but originally it was supposed to include Singapore. So these are British spheres of influence during the era of colonialism. They're really not over at this point. And um, to advance its forces across North Borneo, uh, as you see in green on this map, and um, to win essentially the northern half of Borneo for this Malaysian state, which you see depicted in green. And the opposition to that is the former Dutch colony of the Dutch Indies, now calling itself Indonesia. And so Sukarno is their leader. Remember, he's one of the Bandung um, 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 luminaries. So Sukarno taking the view that he uh, doesn't want the, this Malaysian state led by the British, entirely a British uh, project, certainly that's true, um, uh, encroaching on him in Borneo. So the British are kind of um, confident in, that they can get this project underway because um, they've been conducting a war against the uh, communists in Malaya uh, almost since the period right after the war. And these communists are ethnic Chinese, mostly. So they were fairly easy to single out, except not so easy to exterminate. The British had to chase them into the jungles after they'd driven, out of, driven them out of the cities, broke their trade unions and all the rest of that. And um, it's just a very nasty kind of uh, experience. And they had to use a lot of troops, a lot of weapons, had to recruit a lot of uh, client forces uh, to fight against the communists in Malaya, but they pretty well got it done. And defeated them. And these people were, of course, 
egging on the Johnson administration that uh, this guerrilla war could win. If you just devoted enough attention to it, enough forces, it could win. Uh, so the British, the, inside the administration there, we're always talking about the Malayan example of everything that had been done in Malaya. Anybody, of course, anybody who had fought in Malaya uh, could advise the Johnson administration. A British official who had any experience with Malaya could do that. And, um, and so that uh, is a kind of parallel. How you, a parallel, and you might say an encouragement, a bolster uh, for uh, American enthusiasm to defeat the uh, communists in, in Vietnam. All right, so all that hinges around uh, the question of uh, what are the Indonesians going to be able to do about it? Are they going to be able to put enough forces in the field to contest uh, with Malaysia uh, for some of these um, coastal provinces in North, North Borneo, as you see on this map? Uh, there's essentially the same point that I'm trying to make with the Malaysia in pink, and you see the areas uh, contested. Um, so a lot of British troops were thrown into this, and a lot of weapons, a lot of equipment. And on the side of the Indonesians, Sukarno, they were very much opposed to it, and uh, very much argued against it, did what he could to support anybody who was fighting against the Malaysians in this undeclared war that they were having over North, over North Borneo. So there you see Sukarno with General Suharto on his left, your right. So Suharto is eventually going to overthrow Sukarno. But at first they're working together against the, against the British. That's all, of course, of course going to change. The Indonesian communists were led by D.N. Aidit, A-I-D-I-T. I did. They had uh, probably the biggest communist party in Asia at the time. I mean, outside of China. Um, a giant, gigantic mass movement, maybe more than a million people involved in this movement. And I did was uh, quite a um, um, spectacular kind of charismatic sort of leader. And um, was always arguing the case against uh, the expansion of Malaysia through North Borneo. He had uh, perfectly good relations uh, with Sukarno. So um, cold warriors in the United States could point to this relationship and say, uh, this Sukarno guy is in league with the communists, is leaning toward the communists, playing ball with the communists, of course, that they have a point there, that there is this kind of, this kind of sympathy and cooperation. I mean, not much uh, that they could do. Um, communists were, in short, not trying to overthrow Sukarno with great enthusiasm. They were taking the policy line. They would support him as a nationalist, as a Bandung representative against the imperialists, rather than trying to overthrow him in the name of a communist a project of their own. So that's a conscious strategy of anti-imperialist, anti-imperial bloc uh, that they wanted to have with Sukarno. You can see how that would be viewed from the outside. Mao, of course, encouraged, encouraged this line. So there he is with uh, I did, and uh, they're discussing um, whatever they discuss. <laughs> there, there they are having dinner. There's Rostchoff over in the corner, uh, joining with Mao and Aidit. So the Soviets are, you know, uh, in, a, in an encouraging mode vis-a-vis -vis, uh, communism in Indonesia and generally anti-imperialist project. Not so much the communist revolutionary project, but the anti-imperialist project aided by the communists in Indonesia. Um, at the same time, as these things are going on, uh, Mao is starting to develop his cultural revolution in China, which is going to have a huge impact. But prior to that, 1965, Suharto overthrew Sukarno and carried out a massacre on an enormous scale. You know, we're, so we're talking about maybe a million people or more. Massacred, absolutely massacred. Uh, by anti-communist forces. The entire communist uh, part of the Indonesian uh, party leadership uh, wiped out by, by the Suharto forces. So this was celebrated, of course, um, in the United States, a great victory in the Cold War, 
over Sukarno in Indonesia. Sukarno was not shot or anything. He was um, pensioned out, basically. But he was thrown out of power. And the army took over and then carried out this atrocious massacre on an enormous scale in 1965. A huge setback for Mao's policy in Asia. Just to support Sukarno in Indonesia and also to support the Vietnamese communists under Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam at the same time. So that's a big blow that occurs in 1965. The same year in May, same year, civil rights movement became utterly transformed in the United States. Are, are these things connected? Does, does it, an event on the other side of the globe in China, is it connected somehow to an event in the United States? Do you see things coming to blows with massacres, with bombing, with killing, and all, things that can be covered on television? Do you see an increasing violence elsewhere in the world, increasing violence in the United States. Can you make the argument that this is connected or encouraged? It's part of a spillover, a zeitgeist? I haven't got the answer to that question. Interesting question. We need to ask it. I'm not sure how to answer it, but at any rate, maybe you've done a lot if you've asked yourself that question. Um, we have to wonder about it. Uh, different ways of seeing it are possible. As we're looking at uh, the march of history and how ideas, how the spirit of the times, how the you know, grand forces, which are mental forces, intellectual forces, um, how these move history. Well, at any rate, the civil rights movement in the United States changed utterly uh, during the Watts Rebellion in Los Angeles. Watts is a neighborhood in South Central LA in May of 1965. A memoiristic note here. I was a um, civil rights militant. We were arguing for integration of lunch counters and things like that, actually in the Bay Area and in the Los Angeles area. Um, and uh, we would pick it for this or that. I can still, still consider myself a Kennedy liberal, basically. I was in with all sorts of people uh, who were interested in civil rights. So you run into all kinds of people with all kinds of political ideas um, who want to stick up for black people and generally speaking, you know, want to do away with segregation. So we decided that there was a form of Jim Crow in the North and uh, we, by the way, we did not impose this. Black leaders imposed this. Leaders of core Congress of Racial Equality, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, mostly black leaders, made the argument that in the North, there was a kind of segregation too. Uh, maybe it was not quite as overt as it was in the, in the Jim Crow South, but in the North, uh, you know, a lot of realtors wouldn't sell to black people. Or, you know, a lot of jobs weren't integrated. They wouldn't hire black people. And, you know, a lot of things like that. So in the North, there was a kind of a movement, not much of one, a semi-movement, a pseudo-movement, you might even say, um, of um, um, the defenders of the civil rights uh, movement of Martin Luther King and others. You know, liberal defenders, white liberals, they called us, usually. And uh, we would be picketing about this or that. And then we were on a particular picket line one day and going by some black youth in one of the black neighborhoods in San Francisco. And uh, we're sitting on the stoop there. We start shouting at them, hey, you know, you ought to be part of this. You ought to be part of this. And uh, yeah, this is about you. Um, this is for you. So uh, you ought not to be sitting there. You ought to be joining us. And they would always say to us, every time we did this kind of thing, and they would always say to us, oh, we couldn't be nonviolent. You guys are into that Gandhi, Martin Luther King nonviolence. If we participated, we couldn't be nonviolent. Then we would immediately come back at them and say, oh, what a cop out. You're just doing that because uh, you want to sit on the stoop some more. <laughs> you, you don't want to get off your stuff and uh, actually do something politically. But we were wrong. We were wrong. 
they were not into nonviolence. And they were kind of interested in getting into it, but not nonviolently. Well, it all happened, it all started to change with Watts. So what we're talking about here is a different generation of black youth. Black people, of course, are divided into various categories like any, anybody else. The civil rights movement had been mostly led by black churches in the South, middle-aged, uh, often lower middle class, um, uh, often very humble people too, but often middle class black people in the South. Um, but um, the black movement from this point on became a movement that was led not by them, uh, but uh, by uh, black youth, so young men uh, between the ages of 15 and 30, um, living in big cities in the North. So they got into the movement, but when they got into it, it wasn't just civil rights anymore, um, not just the movement of Martin Luther King anymore, but now uh, a new movement, uh, burning. So they adopted the slogan of an LA disc jockey, burn baby burn. He used to say that when a record was particularly moving, <laughs> a record that he played was particularly moving. He'd say burn baby burn. Then they say it has burn baby burn. They burned down various businesses. Uh, right in the center of Watson created a massive rebellion. So uh, these are kind of people new to politics, but look at the way they're getting into politics. And immediately, the leadership of the civil rights organizations, some of them at any rate, started to go in the direction of this movement, it started to argue in terms of black power rather than civil rights, rather than integration, black power. What does that mean exactly? It's hard to figure. I can't even understand it now. I guess it means black neighborhoods get something called self-determination. This makes no sense to me. And yet that was the slogan of um, black nationalism in the United States, black power, uh, for several years. National self-determination. Well, I don't mean to criticize them and don't mean to say that they had to be opposed because this idea is a little difficult to grasp uh, by, by ordinary people. In fact, that was not the mood. One ought not to quibble with them about their slogans, and all, at least not for the moment, about their slogans. One ought to join them or support them in some way and be part of the same general movement. Um, no doubt these youth are going to be against the Vietnam War, too. And no doubt these youth plus college youth might constitute a youth movement <laughs> that might have enormous potential of a wholesome type uh, for transforming the United States. This mood was rampant. One did not have to be a real leftist to have this attitude. As a matter of fact, many, many people had this attitude uh, who were not at all really leftist, strictly speaking, not in the sense of being a socialist, communist, anarchist, whatever, something like that. No, no, uh, just this kind of general mood. One could be a liberal. One could be a liberal, Kennedy liberal, and feel this way. Um, and um, there did develop two great movements uh, that more or less congealed this spirit into organizational form. In the major uh, black neighborhoods, which uh, many people call ghettos, adopting the language of uh, the Holocaust and the persecution of the Jews, in Europe. They call them black ghettos. That's an interesting use of term, terms there. Um, that uh, the black, um, the black uh, uh, youth were led, um, uh, for the most part, by an organization that started in Oakland in 1966, led by Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, later joined by the um, novelist and convict and amazing personality who I was lucky enough to meet once. In fact, more than once. In fact, I almost had the idea I was having some influence over him, uh, or at any rate, had some discussion with him, um, Eldridge Cleaver. 
So at any rate, at any rate uh, the communists, or I should say the, uh, the Black Panther Party, they emerged as the mass movement of these uh, black youth in the cities. Um, the powers, uh, the slogans, black power, national self-determination, whatever you think of that. And then on the other side of it, um, the white student movement, although it was multicolored, not just white, uh, congealed around SDS. So the Black Panther Party and Students for Democratic Society both had, I think, about the same numbers. So you'd have to say there were numbers in there, tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands. And I think hundreds of thousands is more like it for the Black Panther Party. And then when you take into consider all the people who are in their periphery, who sympathize and participate in one way or another, and you're talking about a lot more people than that. Uh, same way with the SDS. It was on every campus, had contact with all the students. Many students felt the same way that the SDSers did, especially on matters of any action. But of course, the action all centered around opposition to the Vietnam War. Since there's a draft, everybody's got to be interested in that, black or white. So these were developing into a real, what would you call it, revolutionary constituency? Not everybody did call it that. But um, maybe it is. Maybe it is starting to have revolutionary, a revolutionary quality to it, advocating big changes, big oppositions, end to the Vietnam War. And then, of course, an end to racism in the United States. That's a whopper. It's more than just saying an end to Jim Crow, because Lyndon Johnson was passing uh, very ambitious legislation uh, to bolster the voting rights of black people in the South while this is going on. So you can't say that there wasn't, there weren't great reforms going on, but, but that wasn't enough. These people all want more, all wanted more. I should say we all wanted more. We all wanted more than that. Um, so the huge new development in the United States. And so here are some Black Panthers in their characteristic black jackets and berets and the uh, Panther women uh, all making their demonstration. And here are the SDS youth. Um, this is from their march in, uh, in a park in Chicago at the time of the demonstrations against the American Convention in 1968. So these are all SDSers marching along. Um, with a considerable feminist um, internal debate going on about how women didn't get a proper opportunity to lead the movement. And that the men were hogging the limelight. Naturally, of course, there was something to this. So a big movement of feminism uh, developing inside SDS and inside student movements of that sort. And here's the SDS leadership um, shaking their fists demonstratively, shouting in solidarity. Uh, but while this is all going on, the French started to emerge as a real force in world politics, you couldn't imagine this. Can France is not, I don't know, all along in this, in this course, we see France trying to be a great power, but not really. Always at the periphery of great power um, um, interaction and uh, conflict, but always in it somehow, always involved in it. Well, um, de Gaulle started to emerge enormously after the Cuban Missile Crisis. So remember, recap on de Gaulle, he's brought to power in 1958. The secret army thinks uh, that they brought him to power in order to uh, uh, finally win Algeria for the French. Just the opposite, he can't win there, no chance. And he eventually comes to terms with the French rebels and permits the independence of Algeria by 1962. Of course, they hate him, try to kill him a couple of times, a couple of assassination attempts. De Gaulle takes the view the people who are trying to kill him are the same people 
that are linked up somehow with the people who tried to kill and did kill JFK. He did say that. So that has not been pursued much. You can sort of understand why it hasn't, but there it is. Anyhow, um, the Gold's view is that the British cannot simply tag along behind a Anglo-Saxon combination which dominates NATO. That the Americans and British are always conspiring against the French. And, well, if they're not conspiring, they don't have French interests at heart. French need an independent nuclear deterrent. The United States said, no, no, you don't need such a thing. It's ridiculous. Why should you have nuclear weapons? We protect you, etc. And so once de Gaulle determined on this line, he had to follow suit by, um, by uh, offering justification for a French nuclear deterrent. And the justification has to fall into the category of saying that uh, the U.S. deterrent is unreliable. Uh, why would the United States... Um, put their cities under potential threat of nuclear attack in order to defend French cities. No. Uh, a nuclear power cannot defend other states when there's nuclear, a nuclear opponent. Those states have to have their own nuclear weapons. So de Gaulle started making this argument very strongly. By the way, this is almost exactly the time that the biggest strides are made in the Israeli nuclear program uh, with French assistance. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, um, a development. So the French then say, the United States has gone off massive retaliation and they're now on flexible response. That's an indication the United States wants to have, uh, you know, limited war, fire break against uh, nuclear war. What they mean by that, what that means for the French, or the way the French choose to interpret it is, that the United States is looking for a way uh, to keep itself out of a nuclear war in which in a, uh, uh, a warfare will be conducted perhaps in Europe. That's accusation that's always made, made against Kissinger's ideas about nuclear war uh, by a brilliant critic named Raymond Deron, A-R-O-N. Brilliant books, uh, nearly always KOing whatever Kissinger argues. Not just Kissinger, but pretty much KOing Robert McNamara too, and his ideas about nuclear weapons and uh, flexible response and uh, counter city strategies and all the rest of that. In general, the French make the argument, I don't say this is because of any real affinity, substantive affinity, uh, but they do make the argument that they're more happy with massive retaliation. Uh, you can depend more on the United States if it really means an all out war. Otherwise, no country, they say, and it's not really an accusation against the United States. They say no country uh, would threaten its own cities or uh, open its own cities to threat of nuclear uh, attack uh, just to defend another country, even if it were its closest ally. And that country has to have nu nuclear weapons. Well, the British ended up saying something pretty close to that uh, back when they were justifying their nuclear weapons at the end of the 40s. So this is the end of the 50s, the beginning of the 60s. The goal is making, the goal and many others, by the way, are making, um, making this argument in the French press and French journals um, for a false de flop, an independent strike force on the part of the French. They're going to build it. And it's going to come into being at about the same time that the Israeli nuclear weapons, and with French help, a lot of French help, um, Israeli nuclear weapons. These are the people who go, were beaten at Suez and humiliated at Suez. This is their revenge, you could argue. Um, moreover, uh, de Gaulle takes the view that Europe has to be changed. That uh, the Soviet Union is now a second-rate power. At any rate, it's acting like a second-rate power. Now is the time to Europeanize it, to bring it into European councils, make a link to the Soviet Union, to conceptualize a Europe from the Atlantic to the Urals. So the Urals are a, a row of hills in the middle of Russia. So that means bring Russia into Europe. The Europeanization of Russia is a project of the goals. You can imagine how Lyndon Johnson feels thinking this is a threat to NATO. So the European of Russia, 
Europeanization of Russia. And after all, Bill takes the view that the Russians and the Europeans, as he made out in the period of the World War II, when he was arguing for a second, a second front and advertising this to Stalin, um, he says that the Russians and the Europeans are more alike than the Anglo-Saxons are, all right, or than they are to the Anglo-Saxons. Excuse me, I got to say that better. That Russia, Russia has uh, Britain, and, <laughs> that France and Russia have more in common uh, than uh, France and Russia have with Britain and the United States. That the United States and Britain, they are maritime powers. They have no agriculture in part of the United States. He did say this, by the way. Let's pass this by for a second. This is De Gaulle talking. They're different countries, uh, they're, but mainly they're sea animals. They're concerned with maritime, maritime affairs more than anything else. Whereas the French and the Russians are concerned with continental affairs and need to come to terms, need to understand each other on the continent, cannot live permanently in terms of conflict. De Gaulle used to argue this between 1944 and 1947. He hasn't had a chance to argue it up to this time, but at this point he began to argue it. Uh, rather serious. And then he said, um, in Vietnam, um, we can't follow the U.S. policy. We have to advocate neutralization in Vietnam. Neutral solution for Vietnam. The United States gagged on this idea. Johnson gagged on this. Uh, but that's what de Gaulle claimed to be for. So very much, I'll put it, against the U.S. Uh, on its uh, Vietnam policy. And uh, he decided to do more than just complain about it. He decided to take action on it. He was led by an econ ec not led, advised on economic uh, uh, policies uh, by a man by the name of uh, Jacques Rouff, R-U-E-F-F, -F, shown here on the right in this uh, picture. He's with Ludwig von Mises, a great laissez-faire economist. He too was a kind of a right-wing economist, but very much a French nationalist was advising French governments in the 20s to take gold, to turn in British pounds for gold. And now he's starting to say the same thing to the gold. We've got all these American dollars. Americans have been spending a lot of money in Europe, investing money in Europe. Um, we've got to start turning in these dollars for gold. And it's a way of, how to put it, it's a way of acting. It's um, a politique financière comme homme diplomatique, as the French like to say. It's uh, Finance policy as a diplomatic weapon. Using finance as a diplomatic weapon. So in 1965, they took out, um, I think it's $300 million. I mean, it doesn't sound like much now. Um, actually, not so much even then. Uh, but uh, an important indication that they were no longer going to hang on to dollars. They're going to turn them in for gold. A lot of dollars in Europe. So a lot of other countries in Europe start to think in the same terms. And Ruf uh, wrote a very influential tract to justify these things. Uh, it's called The Monetary Sin of the West. The Monetary Sin of the West. What's the Monetary Sin of the West? It's um, a, fet a fetish uh, of the American dollar rather than gold. So let's not get the idea that dollars are just as good as gold. They're not, says Ruf. They... Uh, are only uh, an instrument of American domination. And, uh, and uh, if we want to resist this, we have to fight against the dollar, among other things. And we have to turn in our dollars and get gold. There's nothing like gold. So national power revolves around what amounts to a scramble for gold among great powers. That was the case in the 20s. Maybe one of the causes of the Depression. And um, the French are pursuing the same line. And it's no accident that Roof, as a young man, advised those governments in the 20s and advised the goal in the 60s. All right, so there's where the French are. Um, is the French situation, I could ask at this point, is the French situation rather like the situation of China? Are they trying to opt out of the Cold War? Do they want to be, want to act independently of the United States and NATO, the free world, so to speak. Do they want to act independently? There is something to it. And, um, and they, they do pay attention to each other a lot. They read each other's um, theoretical works. 
and write about them through the French and the Chinese. Um, so, uh, the United States is starting to look a little bit cornered here. Now, well, just a little bit. Things are not going well for the United States. Johnson nevertheless felt he was still capable of dealing many blows. One of them is going to be in the Middle East, where Johnson took a very important decision in 1967 to give the Israelis, at a time when they were getting their hands on nuclear weapons, not even sure if they had a nuclear weapon by this time, but uh, to start to give them lots of tanks and tactical aircraft, artillery, huge augmentation of uh, Israeli forces to the point where they're in a position now to carry out an offensive against their Arab neighbors. Maybe they're always able to really annoy them badly, but now maybe carry out an offensive. And the result of this arming of the Israelis was the Israeli attack. You have to say that it's on pretty much Israeli initiative. Well, there's a big argument over that, the U.S. Intelligence Committee, that some literature um, that discusses, you know, whether certain people at the CIA argued that the Israelis started it, certain people said the opposite. Melvin Goodman's uh, books, Whistleblower at the CIA and other books, um, had to deal with this uh, debate that went on inside U.S. intelligence about whether the Israelis started it, but perhaps they did. Uh, start this thing. At any rate, they certainly got the upper hand over the air forces of Syria uh, and Egypt and over all the forces around them. And they destroyed their air forces right away. And then uh, with their tanks, uh, took over the Sinai, the whole Sinai, right up to the Suez Canal, as you see in this map, took over all of the West Bank. This is the biggest augmentation of Israeli territory we've seen so far. Pretty much the Israel that you see before you. Of course, it's going to be minus Sinai, but we'll talk more about that as we go on. Uh, and the Golan Heights, which they took from Syria during this 1967 war. All this done uh, through, with Johnson, you know, pretty much on the initiative of Johnson. Um, good book on the Israeli nuclear program is uh, Seymour Hersh's book, The Samson Option, which talks all about the difficulties of. Uh, the Israelis getting this program against the opposition of Kennedy, but um, with, the, with the approval, for the most part, of Lyndon Johnson. So big difference between Kennedy and Johnson on the Israeli uh, nuclear program, which is uh, outlined very clearly by, uh, uh, by Seymour Hirsch in this uh, Samson, uh, Samson option. At the same time, a whole series of coups all over the rest of the world Uh, and a, a ripening up of the of the situation in Vietnam, kind of a coming to a, a head situation in Vietnam. So we have to note that in 1965, throughout the one Bush government, did did uh, Lyndon Johnson, with the aid of the FBI. That's kind of interesting. The FBI used uh, outside American um, borders. Um, in the Dominican Republic. So they uh, aided a coup in the Dominican Republic that overthrew the government of Juan Bosch. Um, they green-lighted a coup in Brazil that overthrew the democratically elected government of uh, João Goulart. Um, we've already mentioned the Indonesian affair, which made everybody in the US uh, beltway circles very, very happy, the overthrow of uh, the communists and massacre of the communists in Indonesia. They overthrew um, Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana in 1966, did the uh, Ghanaian uh, military, maybe with the encouragement, it's often thought, uh, with the, of the United States. Maybe these can be thought of as blows delivered by Lyndon Johnson in various ways, kind of an Eisenhower sort of way, thinking back uh, to uh, Guatemala in 1954. Yeah. Shah of Iran in 1954. Maybe uh, blows that can be delivered by Lyndon Johnson. A um, number of people passed from the scene as a result of these 
efforts by the United States. Che Guevara, Patrice Lumumba, Kwame Nkrumah, um, kind of a who's who of the radical left in the world. Um, pretty much Bandung types in some cases. Um, and the people are brought to power. General Pattern, General Mobutu in the Congo, dictator. You know, pretty straightforward, right wing, cor corrupt, conservative, nepotistic, corrupt dictator in Mobutu. And then Suharto, the military rule in Indonesia. Of course, we have to consider also the Shah of Iran, and maybe in the same category. These are the kind of people that the United States is ending up placing its bets on. We're not going to try to make the world progress. We're not going to try to we're not going to try to sell liberalism and democracy and uh, no no. Any anti communist gets our vote. Um, the only good communist is a dead communist. It's pretty much the message that seems to emerge here. At any rate, that's the way it looks from the outside, especially to those who oppose it. And uh, we're trying to stress these opposed forces. They begin to shape up at the end of the 60s, are sharply opposed. It all comes to a head in 1968 during the Tet Offensive. There's a very famous photograph of a shooting of a presumed communist in Saigon by a government general. Um, and that's all captured on television for everybody to watch. Unpleasant stuff, um, which did not add to U.S. prestige there. And the Tet Offensive pretty much indicates uh, uh, coming to the uh, uh, coming to a head of this whole of this whole process. During the Tet Offensive, um, there was a meeting of the wise old men, or wise not wise old men, wise men. Uh, all of the leading figures in diplomacy in the entire Cold War. So Cold War Academy of Leaders uh, on the Vietnam War, and they concluded the Vietnam War is a loser. They can't win there. Time to get out. So that's during the Tet Offensive in the spring of 1968. Bear in mind now, the ruling elites, you have to say, and the most official figures in the foreign policy community in the United States are against the Vietnam War after the Tet Offense in 1968. The argument might be made, certainly was made by people like William F. Buckley and people on the right, uh, the United States didn't lose in Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam was lost at home in the United States. And usually what they mean by that, it's lost by Jane Fonda or lost by radicals in the United States as they try to meet. But if you Look at this. Um, in terms of the enthusiasm of the most elite figures in the United States, most prestigious, most well-heeled um, supporters of the Vietnam War policy, are they ready to give it up? It's not a winner, right? There's a limit uh, to how far they're willing to go. And the United States is not going to win there. And that's pretty much proven by the Tet Offensive, at least as far as they're concerned. That's a huge turn. So from this point on, one has to negotiate. Even Lyndon Johnson maybe has to take a stab at negotiating because he hasn't got anybody supporting him. At any rate, nobody important supporting him anymore. Um, this is probably second most famous picture of some children fleeing from a village that had just been napalmed by the U.S. Very pleasant stuff, as you can imagine. Imagine how the American public feels about the Vietnam War, looking at a photo like that. Look at that boy right up in the front. Look at the look on his face. American people must feel wonderful about the Vietnam War, looking at pictures like that. And then the wreckage in the capital of Hue after the United States won it back. This is what victory looks like. After the United States won it back from the communists, 
in the Tet Offensive. That's what big section of the central part of the city, some of the most uh, exquisite architecture, it was said, um, was located. And of course, troops having to fight against the Vietnamese right in the middle of all the big cities at the same time that at home, more and more masses of people. Now I think you have to say critical mass, maybe more more people against the war than for it, strictly speaking. I mean, even if you're going to be for it, you're going to have to figure out a way to say that you're against it. Nixon is going to have to say he's got a way to get out. Same way that Eisenhower said in 1952 about Korea. I have a way of getting out. The whole tone of the whole thing is changing uh, dramatically. Huge demonstration. Celebrities of various sort. Here you see Vanessa Redgrave and Tariq Ali meeting at a big anti war demonstration in London. And there's another big demonstration in Central Park. And these demonstrations are going into the hundreds of thousands. Once you get demonstrations in the hundreds of thousands, you can start to figure that there's a, almost a majority opinion in the country of a certain sort. Or, at any rate, these people maybe are capable of questioning any policy, that no policy can possibly be properly legitimate if hundreds of thousands of people are demonstrating on a regular basis against it. At home, attitude changes really dramatically. This is a poster of uh, Abby Hoffman and uh, Jerry Rubin. Um, and the argument is now, don't just stop the war, bring it home. Let's have a revolution. And that sort of is what's happening inside the American forces in Vietnam. They're starting to make a revolution, a mutiny against their officers and starting to kill officers on a large scale. American forces are going to fall apart completely in 1969. Maybe I'll talk more about this as we go on. Lyndon Johnson, of course, <laughs> in the famous um, caricature by, uh, by David Levine for the New York Review of Books, uh, he was pointing, he had had a an operation uh, for an ulcer, and uh, they had uh, cut him. He showed his scars. And so uh, David uh, Levine took off on this idea, showing his scars, and there's a scar that is like the map of Vietnam. That's the most important scar that Johnson had to, had to bear. And there are the wise men meeting in Washington who are going to end up turning against the Vietnam War. Uh, all the major figures of American foreign policy, people we've been talking about right from the beginning of this course, um, they're going to have a consensus against the war at this point on. There's Clark Clifford, uh, Johnson's uh, Secretary of Defense, along with Dean Acheson. You remember him, Truman's Secretary of Defense, uh, counseling the president. He's got to figure out a way to get out. At the same time, Martin Luther King led the Memphis um, garbage, uh, garbage workers, Memphis sanitation strike, leading poor black workers entering into the labor movement, making the argument that same kind of activity, same kind of demonstrations, same kind of nonviolence that's been pursued against the um, opponents of civil rights now has to be pursued on a, on a broader scale with the whole labor movement in the United States. And it's not just, not just black people, it's just southern black people. No, it's, it's black people in general and it's blacks and labor combined. Martin Luther King is turning into a real leader of a mass, huge mass movement. Um, you can't say a revolutionary mass movement, but a huge movement and very frightening to its opponents. Uh, and uh, black people in general and people in general. Here's Mark Rudd um, uh, demonstrating and, uh, and developing big strikes at the universities. Mark Rudd was the head of SDS at uh, Columbia, and there he is at Columbia, in the middle of the Columbia strike in 1968. The polls rose up in March of 68. Polls, I think, were excited by what they um, were reading about in the United States and in Western Europe, and decided that their version of it was to rise up against communist rule. Actually, I was there at the time of the University of Warsaw. And so here's a, uh, a medal that has been struck by uh, present Polish regime, 
regime uh, Polska says the uh, Polish Republic um, for the uh, March 1968 rising at the University of Warsaw, which I was part of at that time. I was a grad student there. Yeah, part of it, I was just walking along with the students uh, when, the, when this happened. Um, and there's a Polish slogan against the Russians. This is at a Polish store, but the, uh, uh, but the slogan is in Russian. <laughs> it says, occupiers go home. Occupiers, meaning Russian occupiers, it's in Russian. Uh, occupiers go home, say the Poles. So this is 1968. Big movements with pictures of Trotsky and the rest of that in Germany. Student movement going on everywhere. Che Guevara emerging on a, many continents, not just Latin America, but all over Europe, other places in the world as uh, Great legendary, iconic, uh, iconic figure, huge movements, and uh, such a big movement in Prague that the Soviets intervened with tanks in August of 1968. It was kind of multifaceted revolt, is it not? In Paris, a general strike involving perhaps nine or ten million workers um, supporting the students in a, um, a quarrel over student power that developed at uh, the university at Nanterre. French universities, the 41 French universities at this time, they're all linked together. They're all the University of, of Paris. Uh, no, no, I, I'm, excuse me, 41 French universities, and I think it's 11 universities of Paris, 11 branches of the University of Paris. There's one at Nanterre where the student movement developed uh, in May of 68, and the workers pitch into that. So it's a general strike, and it bring, in the end, it's going to bring down the goal himself. So a, a big re revolution. Here's one of the uh, here's one of the uh, posters from the strike. It says ten years of Shelley. Well, um, looking at a, a film of one of the uh, demonstrations, De Gaulle said, uh, said to Shelley, it's not a demonstration. It's a dog bed, a dog bed, in a real mess. Shelley. And so the French very quickly took up the slogan. Le Shelley said, we, oui. the uh, dog bed is him, the dog bed is De Gaulle. <laughs> so they're against De Gaulle. They're throwing pavement stones at the police, the CRS, the special secret police, not secret police, but special police in, in France. And there's, that's one of their slogans as they threw these paving stones, is, uh, sous le pavé, la plage, um, under the pavement, uh, the, uh, the beach. It was a utopia, you know, a new world, a new world uh, after they throw these stones. <laughs> uh, they're very poetic uh, French, uh, French slogan. That's what the street looks like after you after you do that. <laughs> Robert Kennedy, can Robert Kennedy, in the end, can he save us from all of this? So say members of the establishment, can there be still a liberal solution to all of this? Well, of course there could be. Of course there could be. No matter how radical anybody got, they were still willing to follow the liberals. So it would certainly have followed a Kennedy. But certainly have followed Robert Kennedy. Robert Kennedy wanted to get out of Vietnam. Well, that's a kind of a consensus everywhere in American society by this time. But maybe there were other forces that could not let him do that. And other people had to keep on in the end. Or, as is sometimes argued, Robert Kennedy was going to investigate Jack Kennedy. Maybe that's why. It would have been a good thing for him to disappear. But at any rate, he's assassinated. No sooner than he had won the California primary, which meant that he would have had the nomination, he was assassinated. And then the French made June events. They created the fall of the gold. So the last thing we have to ask is, looking back on all these wars, all of this intense military and revolutionary activity going on all over the world, um, and counter-revolutionary activity to boot. Um, who's winning in this? I don't want to adopt this view that some people have that there has to be winners and losers in everything, but I mean, sometimes history does have a certain quality of victory, some 
one force does get the upper hand over another force. Well, who's got the upper hand at the end of the 60s? What did the 60s decide? Ah, good question. Every once in a while I ask a good, a good question. What did the 60s decide? Well, my, my opinion would be uh, it decided that many of the ideas, even most of the ideas of the left in the 60s, um, ideas that Jim Crow's no good, that segregation's no good, that black people are just like anybody else, um, ideas that uh, you have to treat women right, uh, that uh, women have to be considered in exactly the same way that men are considered. Uh, cannot be separate pay or any of that stuff. No separate uh, uh, status for women by virtue of any kind of familial role or any of that stuff. Uh, absolute equality of rights between men and women. And even an equality of status. Uh, same way with all races, everything, etc. So all these ideas, they're new to the United States. They're all one big time. Okay? It's taking a long time to root them out. They haven't been rooted out yet. So these are big wins, uh, you could argue. In the end, though, who got power? Richard Nixon. He became president. Talk more about Nixon next time. So maybe that is the big victory. Maybe that even though the proponents of the Cold War were losing the Cold War big time, have had the Cold War rejected, first by Bandung, secondly by most of the youth of the world, and are going to lose in Vietnam. Maybe despite that somehow, all that losing that they have won in the thing that counted most, they've kept power, hung on to power. Richard Nixon is going to be president of the United States. He's going to call the shots. Is he against the Vietnam War? Says he is. He's got a way of getting out of Vietnam. He's not telling anybody. But there's no way of getting out of Vietnam. It's a way of redoubling the attack. More people killed after he took power than before in Vietnam. Certainly more bombs dropped. So that is what we have to deal with next the policies of Nixon and Kissinger to carry on in Vietnam in the most determined way and at the same time keep the Soviet Union on board uh, by means of a process of detente. That's the next thing that we'll be charting. Great interest to us as diplomatic historians and as world historians. Um, and that's what we take up when we consider this again.